Our scripture reading today begins in Mark 3.13. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach, and have authority to cast out demons. He appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder, Andrew and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again, so that they, would, they, that, so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. Verse 31, and his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. This is God's word. Err. Feeling extra curmudgeon today. No, just kidding. You don't know what curmudgeon means? No, I think you made Oh, no, you think I made that up. Uh, that makes me even more curmudgeon That kids don't even know what curmudgeon means. Okay, okay, okay. Curmudgeon definition. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I'm habitually stubborn and grouchy. Okay. So, um, okay, I, I got to get into it. Uh, we have a lot of verses to cover, and so uh, I just want to get right into it. I got three main points. First one, we learn about the strategy of Jesus to change the world. Do you know what Jesus does? He hires interns, okay? Okay. So Jesus gets interns to take over the family business. That's point number one. Point number two, the business is piratical. Now you may think I'm trying to spell practical. No, I'm not. Piratical, as in pertaining to pirates, okay? Do do I need to define that one too? There you go. (laughs) Uh, Kids nowadays, okay. Number three, uh, the interns become family, okay? So uh, we're going to talk about these three points. Uh, let's just get right into the text. Um, so in the beginning of this passage, uh, we've been looking at the book of Mark. We've been seeing how probably the two main themes of the book of Mark, commentators will disagree about the wording and they'll disagree about the priority, but uh, there are two main themes. One that Dan has repeated uh, a number of times. Jesus is the powerful son of God. And this is the, where it gets a little tricky. Um, the book of Mark talks about how we should respond to the powerful Son of God, okay? How we should respond to the powerful Son of God. And so we see in Mark chapter 3, verse 13, this is what happens. Jesus went up on the mountain and called to them those whom he desired, and they came with him. So, number one, Jesus is running a family business, and he interviews interns, right? It says he called to him those whom he desired. So, you know, like, oh, you went to Harvard? Yeah, you can come be an intern here. You went to San Jose, no, like, like, where did you, like, you, when you're applying for a job, the interviewer is the one who has the power. They choose who they want to join them. And this is who Jesus chooses to be his interns. Now, what's really interesting is Jesus does not choose the people who you would expect, okay? Jesus was completely demolishing all of our assumptions uh, about who you would choose to change the world, okay? So uh, if you wanted to have um, a lasting historical impact for thousands of years, if you wanted millions and billions of people to be influenced by you, who are the people you would choose to run your company, run your organization, or to create this movement? Who are the people you would choose? Actually asking. Let's see how good uh, hiring managers you are. What do you think? Shout them out. What qualities are you looking for in these people? They're good at math. 
they went to Stanford, they played. <laughs> <laughs> Take a parent's told them to. Oh, dude, that's basically my wife, Ashley. <laughs> and that would not be a bad choice. I would also choose Ashley to uh, have a lasting, no pressure. Um, anyway, who, what, what other qualities would you choose? People with high EQ. People with high EQ? Oh, I don't know. I don't know about that. Loyalty and respect. Um, is this going to be controversial? Did, uh, uh, did Hitler have a high EQ? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Don't, don't, don't get mad at me. Don't get mad at me. <laughs> don't get mad at me. Um, what other qualities or attributes would you want? No, seriously, though. Like, I asked the Hitler question for a reason. Yeah. What do you think? Uh, they work... <laughs> Huh. <laughs> I think there are plenty of people in world history who have worked overtime with little to no pay who have not made any difference in the world. So I'm not sure if that, so like hard work is a quality or characteristic, like for example, people who are victims of oppression, they don't get paid much and they don't really do much, right? Uh, if you were choosing people who would make a big impact, I think you would choose people, okay, if you were me, you choose people who are extraordinarily charismatic and confident. Uh, intelligence is a big deal. Um, one of my favorite examples of this is Winston Churchill, okay? So if anyone knows about who Winston Churchill is, um, you know, like he gave, gave inspirational speeches about fighting Hitler. Uh, but one of the interesting factoids I learned about him was when he was a high schooler, he turned to his friends and he said, one day, I will be the Prime Minister of Britain. And so he became like an admiral. He made horrendous military mistakes. Uh, he was in his, like, what, 50s or 60s or something. But eventually, he actually pulled it off. And so this is like a really interesting fact about Winston Churchill, where I'm like, who in the world not only wants to be Prime Minister, but is like, I'm gonna call my shot and predict that I will be prime minister, and then you actually go and do it. This is like, how many of you wanna be president? How many of you wanna be president of the United States? Number one, most of us slash all of us are Asian, so we would never presume to want something so big, you know? <laughs> no, no, we're never gonna want to be president. We need a different, um, race to do that. But uh, anyway, so you would never presume that, but it's also like, who actually does that? But there are people in history who are generally extremely powerful. It's like, there are these legendary figures. It feels like they've been touched by a deity, and they're so powerful. They're so influential. Alexander the Great, these are powerful, violent people. They're charismatic, they're intelligent, they're military geniuses. These are the people who make a big difference in the world. They're scientists. When you look at scientists, they do work overtime with very little pay, but they're not always known for having the best EQ, Tammy. And she, it's funny, because Tammy actually married one, so does, does Justin have a high? <laughs> um, anyway. So, oh, he's right there, oh shoot. <laughs> um, sorry, Justin. Okay, so who does Jesus choose? Uh, Jesus chooses tax collectors. So these were like social pariahs. Uh, they were hated, they were Benedict Arnolds, they were traitors to the cause. They had the wrong politics, they were betraying their people group, they were cheating people and swindling them. He chose fishermen who did not go to Stanford, were they good at math? I don't know. Matthew, the tax collector, was probably good at math, so someone was right in that regard. But they, these are not the people you'd expect, right? He chooses these people, and he used them to change all of human history and change the world. And what he does is two very simple things. And so when we look at these things, when we look at the way Jesus chooses interns, and how he goes about training and equipping them, I think we learned something so important about what it means to be, uh, I'll say Christian, but what I really mean is to be a disciple or apprentice of Jesus. 
Um, uh, I look at uh, data every once in a while, and there was a survey that came out in, I think, 2023 about the state of Christianity in America. So this survey said something like 63 or 64% of Americans identify themselves as Christian, right? 63 to 64%. Uh, many surveys show that that number is dropping uh, over time. And then there was another question that um, a, a survey asked, which was, how many Americans would identify themselves as disciples of Jesus? Uh, what do you think the number was? 63 or 64% of people say they're Christian. How many people think they're disciples? 1%? Who, some, someone said 4%. 4%. And so what's so incredible to me about this is I used this stat before. Uh, in the New Testament, the word Christian comes up three times, and it's predominantly used by people as a derogatory term. So it's not used by people who are Christian. It's used by people who are making fun of Christians. Instead, over and over again throughout the New Testament, almost 270 times, the word disciple comes up. And so when I was talking about interns, uh, what, what is an intern? When you hire an intern, what is your intention behind hiring them? Can anyone think about what an intern is supposed to do? To, 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 do, to, to get coffee, to do the work. Okay, you guys are being very cynical. Um, let me, let me one-up your cynicism by giving you a peek into a family conversation I had at Mother's Day last night. Uh, so my sister-in-law, Sarah, who I thought she was going to be here, but she's not yet. She, she, she might walk in later. Um, she was talking about how at her company, Microsoft, they are hiring a lot of interns for the summer. So they're going to be like eight interns joining her team. And I said to her, okay, so um, what do you use interns for? Like, what do they do? And she basically said, we give them whatever half-baked projects uh, we can to keep them busy so they won't distract me from the actual work. That is like literally what she said, okay? And so then my father-in-law, who is like a higher up at a, at a, a semiconductor company, um, he, he says, yeah, yeah, that's basically what I would do too. But if they were initiative taking and they asked me questions, I would want to like talk to them and help them out. And then he said, every once in a while, one of the interns will stick and we want to hire them and give them a job, but it very rarely <laughs> happens. So now, um, it, this is what I would say, this is my impression of what getting an intern is like. So this is my definition. Interns, you give them whatever half-baked projects to keep them busy so they don't distract you from doing the real work with the hope they'll eventually be able to be useful enough to give half-baked projects to the next crop of interns. Okay, so you actually want to get your interns to become uh, productive members of society in the company so that they can deal with the interns next time so you don't have to. But the idea is they have to know enough and be able to do enough real work so that they actually can contribute. And so when Jesus is calling these people, what does he say about them? He calls to the people those he desired who had the qualifications that he wants, which in this case is very bizarre, he chooses uneducated, poor people, tax collectors, Benedict Arnolds, and these are the people he wants to take on the family business. And they come to him, and he appointed 12 whom he also named apostles so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. So there are two fundamental things that Jesus calls the disciples to do, and this is actually a picture of what it means to be not a Christian, but a disciple. Every single disciple, every, like every single Christian should be a disciple. A Christian is not like, disciples are not people who are like on the next level of Christianity. Everything that Jesus says in all of the New Testament Gospels is he is assuming that you will become a disciple, which means you will be an apprentice. And so an apprentice or an intern is someone who spends time with their software engineer manager and they look at what they do, and then they take on the half-baked projects, and then they ask the manager for help, and they try to learn and develop skills and be taught by the master 
so that they can become like the master. And so uh, there are three ingredients you need. Uh, this is from a book. Oh, man, okay. Okay, so uh, since I'm a preacher, uh, I normally throw a book at you, the Bible, but in this case, I will throw a different book at you in case you're interested in learning about this. Um, so this is a book by a, by a guy named John Mark Comer called Practicing the Way, and the thesis of his book is that being a disciple means three things. It means to be with Jesus, so you become like Jesus, and then you do as he did. You get me? To be with Jesus, to become like him, do as he did. So what's he talking about? Here he's talking about interns. And so if you want to learn more about this, I will literally give you this book. Who wants it? Raise your hand. Any, any people over here? Too bad. You guys are old. Um, who, who wants it? Who wants it? So, okay, this, this, book, this book is extremely readable. It's, it's like literally made for people who have low attention spans. So, <laughs> uh, are there pictures? I don't know. Wait, wait. Oh, sorry. I should have asked. Are you actually going to read it? Oh, no. Okay, then give it to Daniel. So, Daniel, Daniel once you're done with it, uh, go find another person to give this book to. So, uh, if you notice, what he's taking, that his thesis there is straight from this passage. He takes people who are... Um, apostles, which means simply people who are sent out. So they're given a mission by Jesus. And then what he says that they should do is, number one, he appointed 12 whom he named apostles so that they might, number one, be with him. And number two, send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. So the first one is about relationship, right? The first one is about communion and presence and intimacy with this master, where if you want to become um, a practicing, if you want to like become a, like a yoga practitioner, what some people do is they go to India and they follow around a guru for a, a given period of time. And so you have stories of people who come from the West and they go to uh, India and they follow around a guru from a year, for a year, like literally a year. They just go wherever they go, they watch what they do, they learn their practices, they ask for help and instruction, they try to learn. And so everyone would have known this is what Jesus was doing. He's saying, if you want to be my disciple, I'm going to choose you. I'm going to choose the people people don't expect me to choose. And then I'm going to invite them to live life with me, to constantly be around me and get to know me and be influenced by me and see my character, see my attributes, see what I'm like with the hope that over time they would become like him and then do as he did. So they might be with him and he might send them out to preach and to have authority to cast out demons. So two things here. Uh, Jesus, when he came, he came preaching and casting out demons. And we've seen this in the book of Mark. Uh, his first goal was to declare the gospel of the kingdom of God, the good news of the kingdom of God, which was basically like Superman has arrived on the scene. Jesus is God, Jesus is man. He has come to set captives free, to heal people who are sick, and then number two, to cast out demons, which is he is exerting power over dark supernatural forces that oppress and destroy and ruin people's lives. And so Jesus, the very first miracle he did in the Gospel of Mark was what? Casting out a demon. And so what Jesus is saying here is, I want you to be my interns. I want you to be with me so you can learn how I live, how I do things, and then uh, you will replicate my work, which is to preach and to have authority to cast out demons, okay? And so he appoints the 12, he, he gives them new names. Uh, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, uh, he gave the brother of James, uh, the name Sons of Thunder, James and John. Uh, and so Jesus wants them to be with him and to do what he did. And so in the same way, uh, one question that I have for us is, you might think Christianity is about going to church, reading the Bible, praying, all these different things. But at its very core, um, the actions of Christianity are to be with Jesus and to become like him and to do what he did through an apprenticeship or discipleship or internship relationship. 
And so this is actually so important because what explain, like, do you know the implications of that st uh, statistic I gave? 64% versus 4%. It means that these numbers are not precise, but around 60% of people are not being shaped and formed like Jesus is. But they go to church, they say they're Christian, and most people's impression of what a Christian is like is determined by that mass of 64% of people. And so, honestly, this is a really powerful apologetic statement. Um, I really believe that one of the reasons we see hypocrisy, judgmentalism, um, scandal within the church is because people are so busy trying to do stuff for Jesus, like political campaigns or whatever it might be, even activism, whatever it might be, they're so busy doing things for God because they think they know what God wants, but they're not doing it with God, okay? They're not involving God in what they do. They're not letting themselves be formed by a personal relationship with Jesus as their master. And because of that, you have Christians who have no, there's no change in their lives. There are people who say they're Christian, but they're constantly angry or lustful or deceive people. They lie, they steal, uh, they commit adultery. They do all these different things, and it's because they are not actually joining Jesus in the way he asked us to, which is to become my disciple. He says, become my disciple, which means I'd spend all of my time. I have new priorities. Discipleship involves giving careful attention to what Jesus says, and then discipleship involves obeying what the master says. So you can't be a disciple if you're not giving attention to the master. Um, do I, I'm going to make fun of your son a little bit. Uh, so uh, I love teaching weightlifting to people. And what, what I've noticed is I have to like figure out what type of person you are when I'm going to teach you weightlifting. If you're not paying attention, bad stuff can happen. And so I remember um, I was weightlifting with Roger and Winnie's son one time. And uh, so he's like putting weights on the side, like I'm about to bench press. So I say, put a 45 and a 25 on each side. So I like, he, so I do it on one side, he does it on the other side, get under the bar, I'm about to lift it, and then I go like, whoa! Do you know why? He did not listen to me. He put totally different weights on one side than I put on the other, which is very, very bad. Like that's very, very dangerous. And so I had to impress upon him the importance of paying attention when I tell you what weights to put on. Um, so he didn't listen and he didn't obey. And for many of us, uh, we are so busy, we're so distracted. Because we're not paying attention, we don't even know what Jesus is about. Because we're not paying attention, uh, when he asks us to do something, we might not even notice. And then even if we did hear him, we wouldn't want to do what he says. And so all I'm saying there is, I'm not trying to like condemn anyone. I'm just trying to say, if you say you're a disciple of Jesus, know what it means. Know what it entails. It doesn't mean being perfect, because a disciple is someone who doesn't know as much as the master. But it means learning. It means saying, I know what I don't know. I see what the master does, and I see my shortcomings. I am not like Jesus in so many different ways, and I'm speaking personally. I am not like Jesus in so many ways, but I want to learn from him. And so when I'm, a, um, as a dad, it's like I hang out with Toby, and it's like I very frequently lose my patience with him, uh, but I don't express it in a super bad way. I just kind of lose interest with him, or I start like rushing him, or I don't pay attention to him. That's just, that's just like a struggle that I have in a way that I realize I still have a long way to, grow, to go in terms of being a disciple of Jesus. So then what do I do? I say, God, please help me learn what it looks like to be a father. Jesus, as your apprentice, can you teach me what it means for me, Daniel, to be a father to my son and a husband to my wife and a pastor to people and a friend and whatever it might be, a coworker? This is what it means to be a disciple. It means asking Jesus, how, how do you want me to live who you've made me to be? You know what I mean? You don't, have to, you don't have to be Jesus. He made you uniquely. But it means asking him for help for learning how to live the way he would have you live. And then actually doing it imperfectly um, over a, through a process that takes a long time. But that's what it's all about. Okay, let's keep going. So uh, the business is piratical. Okay? So here's a story. 
Um, where, did, where is my piratical slide? Do I have a pri piratical slide? I forgot if I made one or not. I can't find it, so I'll just tell the story. So um, when I was in seminary, uh, I had a friend. Oh, oh, here it is. OK, so d developing your piratical skills. I had a friend who I um, edited seminary papers for. OK, so I was like a creative writing major in college. And I do like writing, but it's funny that I, um, he asked me to edit his papers because I'm really bad at editing my slides. Uh, but he asked me to like check for typos and say when, when things don't make sense. Um, but one thing about him is uh, he's dyslexic. And so dyslexic is like you can't, like you can't get the, the letters in the right order. And so he, he constantly would get them mixed up. And so this was my single favorite sentence that I had to edit. The overall, this was him talking about training to be like a pastor, and he was an intern at a church. The overall goal of my internship is to develop the intern's piratical skills conducting different ministry events. Piratical skills. I thought that was so funny. Is that funny? I don't know. You guys don't think it's that funny. Well, I think it's funny. Um, because it's like the church is training him to be a pirate or something. Uh, but no. It's supposed to be practical skills. But when Jesus interacts with the scribes, what you learn is piratical is actually not that far off. So let's see, let's see where we get that. This is 22 through 23. I'm kind of going to kind of zip through this section. The scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he casts out demons. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? So what's going on here? People see the miracles that Jesus does, and he is a threat to the religious establishment. And so without doing much investigation, they, they know, because there are so many different people who are reporting that Jesus is doing miracles, that Jesus is doing some incredible stuff. And he's getting a large following. And so what they have to do is they have to find some way to discredit him or explain away all the miracles that he's performing. How do they go about it? They say that he's possessed and that he's using the power of the devil to cast out the demons, okay? Now, does that make sense? Jesus says, no, that doesn't make sense. And then he goes on to sh show them why. If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom can't stand. So pretend for a second that the US military spent half of their time taking pot shots at other branches or soldiers in the US military. How long would it take before other countries saw the U.S. being totally ridiculous and they're like, oh, we should take over. Like, let, they're so weak. They're so divided. Let's take them over. And so which, that's Jesus' point. If the devil is giving Jesus power to cast out demons, then the devil is divided against himself. Why would the devil want to do something that helps a person? Why would the devil want to defeat his lackeys? It doesn't make any sense. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. And this is where we get what business, what family business Jesus is about. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder what do pirates do? They plunder. <laughs> Piratical? Uh, okay. Yeah, thank you for who clapped. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Zoe. Um, it's, it's, it's rough, right? It's a stretch, but that's fine. Uh, the whole point is Jesus is about plundering the work of the devil. Jesus is about taking the influence that the devil has over the world, which is tremendous, and he is about destroying it. And he's about healing people and saving people. And so this is where the whole work of Jesus had to do with freeing people from addiction, from slavery to demon possession, mental health issues, physical health issues, freeing us all from our deepest disease, which is the disease of sin and death, um, and reconciling us to God. And so when Jesus is forming interns to take over the family business, he is saying to you, and he is saying to you all, if you are a disciple of Jesus, I want you to participate in my mission to plunder the work of the devil. 
Now, that sounds really weird and spiritual to many people, so let me make it more real. Now, what I said was real, but let me make it more accessible. Um, if you had the ability to help your friends who are suffering from deep depression or mental health issues, would you want the ability to do that? Would you want to do that? Even if it caused you great distress or there was a great cost to yourself. I think many of you would say, like, absolutely I would do that. Absolutely I want to do that. And this is what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying there are some issues, there are some people who need this incredible amount of help to be delivered from these issues that plague them, these intractable problems that they have in their life. And as your master, I have healed so many people, I can show you how to do that same thing. And this may seem like hot air to some of you if you haven't, like, if you haven't actually seen what happens in churches, or maybe your impression of churches is colored by what people say from the outside. But what's so cool to me is in our churches, we basically see slow motion miracles taking place over years, all the time. You get me? We, say, we see slow motion miracles. A miracle happens like bam, right? But what happens in our church is people are healed and set free. I see youth who are depressed, who are like anxious, like they're different, they change, they grow. I see parents and adults who have real problems with loving their kids, or they put so much pressure on their kids to perform or achieve, and then by encountering the grace and love of God for them, they are changed and they parent their kids in different ways. I've seen this happen in our church. I believe this has happened in my life. I believe this is all through what Jesus does and is doing. And he wants you to have a role in setting people free. It's not by our power. It's definitely not based on our smarts or our skillfulness or giftedness or whatever it might be. It's based on learning from Jesus what it means to be human and learning from Jesus uh, how we can play a small role in helping people. So um, one of our church members, Yvonne, is a counselor and so um, I think I got a C plus in pastoral counseling in seminary. So uh, don't take my word for it. But one of the things I've learned from that, that course, which I'm, I'm sure Yvonne does, is um, a question you come to, with, to Yvonne is like, you're dealing with people who are very broken and dealing with all kinds of difficult issues. How do you help them? And doesn't it feel overwhelming? Like, what do you do when you don't feel like you have the tools to actually help these people who are hurting for whatever reason? Um, and one of the books that I read, which is probably the most helpful book I read in seminary, most uh, practical, piratical, is um, it's called Solution-Focused Pastoral Counseling. And one of the assumptions that they tell you to go in with as you're going to do a counseling session with someone is assume that the Holy Spirit is already at work in the life of your counselor and seek to discern how the Spirit is working and partner with the Spirit. You hear me? So what that says is God is already at work in the lives of the people who you want to help, and your role is not to fix them at your pace because they're causing irritation to you or annoyance or you're impatient for them to stop hurting so bad. What your role is is to ask God for wisdom and say, God, what are you doing in their life? And then how can you use me to partner um, to help contribute to what you're accomplishing? I think this is actually a super duper wise way of approaching these problems where you are willing to acknowledge your lack of capacity or limitations. You can say, this is totally above my pay grade, God. Can you help? Can you help give me wisdom? So for uh, me and Dan as pastors, a lot of the times when people have problems that are above our pay grade, we want to support and care for them and pray for them and speak the truth to them. And we often refer them to other professional counselors because we can't deal with it. We don't, we don't have the tools. We don't have the tools. But this is what it looks like to take on the family business. Jesus actually wants to make you into a person who through your presence, through your wisdom, and it doesn't even have to be like problem solving. Have you ever met someone who is just so incredibly positive and loving and caring and considerate that you want to spend time with them? And when you spend time with them, you feel some of your depression lifting because of their attentiveness. They listen to your problems. They, they show that they understand and that you can, sh like, they, they, they demonstrate 
that they know and care for you as you share the problems you're going through. You can become that type of person because that's what Jesus was like as you apprentice to him, as you learn from him. Okay, so the business is piratical. Finally, um, the interns become family. So uh, today's Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to you mothers. Um, this passage is offensive to mothers. <laughs> I did not select this passage. This was completely coincidental, but surely it's not. Like, surely, like, we didn't plan this. Like, we weren't like, what day is Mother's Day? Let's preach on this passage on that day to get those mothers. Um, so let's see what happens with Jesus and his family. Uh, if you look at verse 20 and 21, P, uh, his family sees Jesus doing these miracles, a crowd gathering around him, Jesus doing incredible things, and his family says he must be out of his mind. And then in this section, in verse 33 through 35, 31 through 35, uh, we see the, the bookend. This is like the uh, conclusion of the little story, the little narrative arc about Jesus and his family. His mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called to him. So this is when Jesus is teaching about binding the strong man, his work to defeat the work of the devil. He is teaching the people who want to learn about the kingdom of God. And so his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent him and called him. So what's happening here? He is in a small Middle Eastern house, and only a certain number of people can be inside. And there are so many people who want to see him that there are crowds of people cramming themselves inside, and then when there's no more room inside the house, they're cramming themselves all around the outside. They're looking through windows. They're peeking. They're trying to see Jesus. They're like trying to hear him. And there are even more people and more people and more people. And so there are all of these layers of people. Um, have fun performing for the mothers. <laughs> uh, there are all of these layers of people who are trying to get in to be with Jesus and hear from him. And his mother and his brothers are left on the outside. And so, like, like, so uh, I don't know if you knew this, but Jewish people are very similar to Chinese people. I'm serious, the culture is very similar. Jewish people are extremely collectivistic and family-oriented. And so we, there's the idea of familial piety, right? You have your obligation to your family. Uh, when you have holidays, you gotta do it. You just go. You don't wanna go, just go. Just make yourself go, just suffer, grin it, silence, whatever. This is what the expectation that Jewish people would have had for Jesus. Jesus is a son. And so if his mother is saying, Jesus, come get me, like I'm outside, like I want to go to the front of the line, Jesus was expected to have stopped everything, say, I got to take care of my mom, go outside, go find her. But that's not what Jesus does. That's not what Jesus does. This is what happens. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. So they're basically saying, your mom's looking for you. It's Mother's Day. Aren't you going to go, like, show love to your mom? Or, or you better do this, or else you're a bad son. You know, like, that's what good sons would do. They go out to see their, parent, their family. And then he answered them and said, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. And so what is Jesus saying here? He is saying, right now, my mom and my brothers are vying for my attention. They want me to interrupt the mission that I'm on, the mission that has to do with casting out demons and preaching the gospels, preaching the gospel. I'm, I'm like... I'm out of it today. So this is the mission that he's on. And he basically says, Mom, brothers, you can wait because I'm doing something more important. Isn't that insulting? Isn't that offensive? So, okay, for you youth, this is, just, this is for you. If your parents say to you, <laughs> if your parents say to you, I want you to do your homework, not like go to Friday night youth group, then you say, I am on the mission of God. <laughs> And uh, who is my mother? No, no, no. That's not what Jesus is doing. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus does not pit family members against each other, but he does demand ultimate priority. 
So what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? It means to honor your father and mother. It means to respect them and listen to them as far as it depends on you. It means seeking forgiveness and reconciliation when they wrong you. Uh, it means doing what you can to meet their expectations as long as they don't conflict with what you believe God's call is for you or his will for you, right? But there is a qualifier there where basically if your parents are calling you and they're giving you expectations that get in the way of your apprenticeship to Jesus, then it is very reasonable and good to say to not, okay, do this in a very respectful way or more, more have a conversation with them about this basically where you say, God is really important to me and I want to respect and love and obey you, um, but this is super duper important. Can we talk? Can we negotiate? Can we figure out what is reasonable? Something we can both agree upon. And then if they just won't listen because they don't want you to pursue God, uh, they don't want you to be a disciple or apprentice, then at some point it might mean saying, I'm going to follow God, whatever might happen. And Jesus is more offensive to mothers later on where he says, unless you hate your father and mother and brother and sister, you can't be my follower. And what he's saying basically is, you, if you hold familial obligation above discipleship to Jesus, then you are not a disciple of Jesus. And so Jesus can actually bring breakage and tension and disunity within families. At the same time, Jesus can heal and fix fractured relationships in family. And so let me try to make this a little bit practical when there's disagreements. Uh, okay, so let me look from, first from the example, from the perspective of youth. Um, what I would say to you is, until you're an adult, you're under your parents' household and protection. And so you can't make unilateral decisions about what you're going to do. You should listen to your parents and respect them and all that stuff. You have to wait until you are an adult to make real decisions. Um, that is a way that you can be a disciple of Jesus and love and respect them. You can pray for them. You can forgive them. You can share the gospel with them. We've had youth who have shared the gospel with their parents, and their parents have become Christian over time, which is really, really cool. Um, but it also means uh, within your power, prioritizing apprenticeship to Jesus, learning from him, following him. And this might cause conflict with their expectations of you. That's just right in the passage, right? The mission of God can cause conflict with other people's expectations of you for your future, for your future job, for where you're going. Let me go out the perspective of parents. Uh, when your kids don't want to be apprentices of Jesus, but more than anything you want them to be, what can you do? Um, what I would say is the most important thing you can do is to be an apprentice of Jesus. Do, do you hear what I didn't say? I didn't say try to force your kids to be an apprentice of Jesus. I said be an apprentice of Jesus yourself because what the kids watch, what they see in you is far more influential than anything you say or tell them to do. And so if you're so busy trying to get your kids to go to church that you don't go to church, is that doing them any good? There is a story about a pastor who had this exact same problem. There was a very concerned, loving mom who said, I'm so concerned that my daughter in high school is not going to Bible study and youth group and church. Uh, what can I do about it? So they talked to the pastor. And the pastor said, uh, so are you going to adult Bible study? Are you making an effort to show up to these different events? And the parents said, uh, no, I'm too busy. I have all these different things going on. My responsibilities at work. And at that moment, they both knew at the same time, why does your daughter not have any interest in Bible study? Because she is following the example that you've set for her. And so this is actually really crazy. Um, there's a book by a rabbi named, Fe uh, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the name. Um, it's called Failure of Nerve. I'll probably remember the name in a little bit. But he basically says, uh, the most important thing you can do in family dynamics, you can't control the other people in your family. If you try to do that, you'll just wreck the relationship. What you can do is pursue your values. The things that you think are really important, you should go after them with all your might. And then that is the way that you can actually have an influence on other people. But notice, this is a non-coercive, 
non-anxious influence where you are not trying to control them. You let them be themselves and you go after what's important to you to be an apprentice or a disciple of Jesus. I think that's a picture of what it looks like. And then uh, what we see next about Jesus and this statement, this is so funny. Um, in the middle of, I, <laughs> I, the, okay, I, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to keep going. So the world is full of voices vying for your attention. These voices can pull you away from the work of God. Uh, Jesus encourages those who seek him to sit at his feet and listen. So Jesus here is subverting his familial duty to show that his family transcends blood. Let me give, you, give one more thing that I would like um, the older group to do. So, uh, so let me get into some, some kind of practical, practical stuff. Um, for youth, you guys are awesome. Seriously, just come as much as you want, learn, uh, try to figure out whether there is actually something to church and Christians, honestly. You can say, like, let me look at the people at church, let me look at my, my parents and their friends and all these other people, is there something going on here or is there nothing? If there's nothing, then, I don't know, don't go to church. Like, you can rediscover, God will keep seeking you, but you can, uh, you can kind of just make a judgment about it. Um, if you are older, uh, if you're a parent, here's one thing I would say. What Jesus is saying is that whoever does the will of God is his family. And this means that being a Christian is a familial bond that transcends blood. You are not obligated only to your bloodline. You are obligated, to some degree, to the whole family of God. And this is so incredibly important. This means that Sunday is family time. Why do you go to church? You go to church because you want to be together with your family and you want to encourage and support them. You want to be there for them. You want to be an example for them. And so if you say, I'm too busy for this, this is the message that's going to be communicated, right? Um, and so first, be an apprentice to Jesus and a model, which means making room and dedicating your attention and obedience to what God is saying to you personally before you care about what you know is right for your kids. Uh, the final thing I would say is, this is something that, again, the, the data shows. One of the most important things older Christians, like young adults, like Derek is a youth counselor, Sarah and Sabrina and some other people, they all help out with youth group. One of the most important things that kids who are trying to understand who God is can have in their life is a non-parental adult who is a believer who can, they can actually ask their real questions to. So you are not going to ask your parents about sex or about like any of these other kind of issues that you have, but you can ask youth counselors about this, okay? You can ask Dan about this, a non-parental adult who you can actually be real with, right? And so this is why it's so important that all of the adults and all of the parents look at the different people in the church and they don't say, I'm going to take care of my family. I'm going to prioritize my family. Instead, they can say, turn to someone next to you, look at them right now, and say, you are my brother, my mother, my sister, my father, whatever it might be. Once you understand this truth, it completely changes the way that church operates and the way what church means. It means I am not coming here just for myself. I'm coming here for my family and I want to make time for my family. And it means taking your um, priority simply off of your blood family and also giving it to other people. So one example of this, I think Ashley is really cool, my wife. Um, happy Mother's Day. So when Ashley, uh, when Ashley started renovating the nursery, our church nursery, she said a lot of the reason for that was because our church nursery was in bad shape and she wanted Toby to have a good place to be in. But over time, as she worked on it and as she coordinated the nursery volunteers, we got to know a lot of the other moms on the Chinese side who have young kids. And so before, Ashley was only caring about Toby, but we've come to meet a bunch of the other kids like Austin, little Daniel, and their moms. And she's been doing a really great job at showing care for the other moms and showing care for the other kids. Where it's like, they are not her son, 
but in one sense, they are her children, and she wants to care for them and love them. And so here's a challenge for you. For you youth, use the older people as resources. Ask them questions. Talk to them. Ask them specifically, if you want to be a disciple of Jesus, what was it like for you to learn from Jesus? What, ha what difference has Jesus' teaching made for your life? And you will have some really interesting conversations with your parents if you ask them that question. And then you also will be able to de basically detect BS. Um, for, you, for adults, same thing. Will you invest in other kids who are not your own and say to them, I want to love and care for you and sacrifice for you? That is such an incredible privilege that we have as being in the body of Christ. And it is opening up your love to more people, which is always what the love of Jesus and the love of God is about. Um, finally, when Jesus was saying he commits to his family, whoever does the will of God, there is father and brother and mother and sister. What he's saying is, um, you are my family, and I'm willing to give everything for you. And so what he's saying is, if you are a Christian and you put your faith in him, Jesus was willing to die for you. Some people who are good family members might be willing to die for their family, but they are not willing to die for strangers. Jesus sees other people, the whole world, as his family, and he was willing to give everything to die for them so that they could become adopted and become part of God's family. That's how much he loves you. This is what Jesus is about. Uh, this is what it means to be a disciple. This is how much he loves us. And this is how we can pursue him in a distracted world. Our attention is everywhere. It's so important that we keep him first and prioritize him above everything, our work, our family, our money, our achievements, our school, because he puts those things in their right priority and perspective. Uh, and this way we can take part in the mission of Jesus in the world, which is so beautiful and good. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you that we can gather together as our family, um, that we can fix our eyes on you. Um, I do pray for uh, all the moms here that have physical children, that they would feel joy and appreciation for all the sacrifices that they've made. I pray for all the people who don't have physical children that they would know that they have spiritual children, that they have family, even if they're alone, because of what Jesus did. And so I pray, Father, that we would be able to see our spiritual family as so important, and that would mean taking risks, that would mean opening up our hearts to love people we are not related to by blood, and that would really bring more people to trust you, to know you, to believe your good news, and that would heal and set people free. I, believe, I pray, God, that you would reparent us through your church, and you would give us clarity about the role that we have to play in that. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.